Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Room for Growth. Today, we have a bit of a special treat. I have three growth strategists from the practice with me today, and we are going to bring a bit of our life cycle marketing lens, our expertise around user experience and user design uh, to talk about something that we personally care a lot about. It's consuming our sleep. It's keeping us awake at night. We are starting prayer chains on this topic, <laughs> and that is how we get tickets to the Beyonce Renaissance Tour. Taylor Swift, you are out. We are bored of hearing about the Ticketmaster woes for the Taylor Swifty fans of the world. We're not talking about that today. We are focused on our queen, Beyonce. But really what we want to talk about is how can we make the state of ticket sales for these high profile events, for these really limited offer tours better because there's a lot to be desired in the space. So today I have three guests with us. Quinn, do you want to start by introducing yourself? I am Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, and uh, as Billy said, I work on the growth team. I'm a growth strat strategist for a liquor brand. All right, so I'll go ahead and kick us off and just talk about the overall experience. Um, I had to register first, so I'm a major Beyonce fan. Like, I have not turned this album off, you know. Um, I was very surprised when I got my insights, you know, my year, my end of year wrap up, and she was not number one. I was personally offended. I actually thought that Spotify got it wrong. You know, yeah, I, I think this is important. Wait, so you're talking about you're registering on Ticketmaster yes. to buy these tickets, but you're saying Spotify has told me that I like should be a top fan of Beyonce. That's the only album I listen to. I think this is important that we keep these experiences yes. separate because yes. part of our thought here is like what Spotify is doing well in the space that Ticketmaster can't do. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going. So you're yes. registering. You're yes. a super so, fan. Super fan. Registered on Ticketmaster. I registered for Atlanta um, I, because that's where I am. You know, I'm not really interested in traveling to another city, uh, renting hotels, you know, plane tickets, any of that. I feel like as a fan, I should be able to register under one email address, one time, and register as a Beehive verified fan. I should have gotten an access code, Beyonce, Ticketmaster. I mean... So this is the point. So in the process right now, what you basically have to do is you have to register for a chance to buy a ticket. So yes. it's not just tickets open. No. And you go to a website and you buy them. Now it's sort of like a period of time opens. You can register to maybe be chosen via some kind of lottery with some yes. fairly vague description yes. of what could disqualify you if you are, whether you're eligible. They put you in a holding group after you register, yes. and then you might get a code to be able to purchase tickets. And the waiting game between those blocks of yes. time is pretty significant. We're yes. talking about days and weeks of yes. waiting. Meanwhile, you only had like two days to actually register, you know? So it closed. I'm like, I'm trying to go back. I'm trying to see what's going on. You know, they, Quinn Hicks, you know, show me my email address. Tell me that I'm registered. They send me the confirmation email, which was just entirely too long. It was a lot of information to try to consume, you know, while my adrenaline is pumping for Beyonce. You know, it is, is I'm not reading. Okay, I registered. This is great. I'm going to get an access code. I, in fact did not get an access code, you know, until she added two additional dates. Like I didn't get, I didn't get a follow-up email to say I was waitlisted or anything. I never got anything. So I was just panicking. I'm like on the massage table, you know, with my massage therapist telling him, you're going to have to wait because Beyonce tickets going to sell. And I have to see if I'm actually going to get in. Yeah. This is a fairly like disruptive experience because you're entering into it. You're registering for tickets. You have very little information about what you're providing and how it's being used. You are warned that you could be disqualified if you try to like break some vague rules about registration. You're not allowed to register in multiple places, but sometimes you are. You can't use multiple emails, but you probably maybe could get away with that. Like fairly vague up front. There's no clear cut like prioritization. For instance, if you are a the purpose of this process is supposed to be to make sure that people who can afford to buy lots of tickets and then resell them at a much higher price can't do that. And the actual fans who care about the music experience, care about the concert experience, get a chance to buy these tickets. And yet what's happening is there's sort of no sense of prioritization. Does it matter that I actually live in the city, that the registration that I'm providing has an address that's where this concert's taking place, right. that I'm part of Beyonce's fan club already and I have been for multiple years. 
there's no sense of that. There's also no clarity around when am I going to hear back? When will I get this code? How long will I have? So it becomes really disruptive to like work days and life. Certainly. Because, you know, we were on our meeting and it was time for me to buy my tickets. I had to go off camera. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like, no. And then after I bought the tickets, my adrenaline was so high. I was just like vibrating. I was shaking. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to go calm down. Like, I had to go for a walk because so I was not going to make it. Eventually, you did get an access code. You did eventually, get a chance when she it. added the third day, I got an access code uh, Sunday night at 6 01. But it came randomly. Random. So you had no idea. No when you idea. Get it. Did you get a push or an email? I got an email and a push. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. At least you got a push from Ticketmaster. Mm-hmm. That's good. Mm-hmm. That's helpful. Yeah. Finally, you know, even though I should have gotten the very first tour date in Atlanta. Beyonce was going to get a letter if I didn't get an access code. <laughs> I don't know what. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so I'm playing, like I said, playing in that email space day to day. I'm too, like, a big super fan for Beyonce. Going back to a little bit with what Quinn said, I was going to have to travel with Darla. She wasn't coming to my city. So I registered for a city in every group. So I got a lot of emails. A lot of emails, right? Just waiting, just trying to get my chance um, to purchase these tickets. And so as I was, you know, sorting through, like, just waiting on edge, like, trying to see, like, what's next, what's next, a lot of big questions for me, because one, adrenaline pumping, like, just trying to register and do everything you can. I signed up for the, um, one of the first ways was the Beehive Verified Fan page. So that's a little nod to fans and that you sign up for the Beehive newsletter, which love to talk about user acquisition on that, like how many people signed up just to be a part of that pre-sale experience. And then there were some other like brand partnerships, like City, Spotify, just kind of tiered down the way that I was, you know, again, I'm just going to take advantage of every opportunity that I had to play in that space. So again, inundated with emails, I'm going to counter Quinn's point. I did like the clarity in in some of those. There was some clarity, maybe to a fault, I think they were, again, trying to clean up after Taylor Swift, what Ticketmaster was doing, kind of telling you, this is what this is, and this is what it is. If you've registered, that doesn't mean you're going to, you know, get a chance to buy a ticket to the tour. So I thought that was important, but I think it was lacking a little bit of personalization. Um, Like I said, I registered for a lot of cities and I got a lot of emails, but it was hard to tell the difference between the two. I couldn't really tell, like, all right, well, I registered for New Orleans, I registered for Dallas. I was like, you'll hear next steps on this date. So at this point, I've got like next steps. This registration process is over the course of about three weeks. So I'm like, this day, am I trying to buy New Orleans tickets? Am I trying to buy Dallas tickets? So just trying to, you know, decipher through, yes, a lot of information and detail within that email process. Um, And so there was some opportunity, but I think, you know, there was still a lot to be desired, but also some good clarity that you needed. You're about to spend a lot of money. Yeah, but that's interesting that even... With a tool like Braze or a good customer engagement platform, you could be doing a lot of things to make sure that if there's a multi-city sign-up process to Mm -hmm. register, you don't have to send an email or a push for every one of those cities Mm -hmm. with vague information that then the user has to track. It would be really easy to make sure each of those cities could be dynamically loaded in, Mm -hmm. personalized to you so that you can see, hey, for Dallas, ticket codes haven't gone out yet for... You know, Cincinnati, if you haven't heard anything, it means you don't have the chance to buy tickets Mm -hmm. there. It'd be easy to track those modules and load them into one email so that you're not getting inundated with messages that you have to go back and search and keep track of. It should be like a relatively, like that's something we kind of do every day, a content block that's automated, that's personalized, and that just has some like basic logic around it. Definitely. Lots of opportunity. Like I said, just to keep keep my head straight. I'm, I'm like, I'm working really hard. I'm trying, I want to know what I'm getting into um, and just be able to stay up to date in a really at a glance way. So, How do you feel about like the tone of the messages that you were receiving? Do you feel like they kind of match the emotional cadence that people are in? Because to your point, these are like pretty stressful experiences. You wouldn't think buying concert tickets, sure, when you compare <laughs> that to like the relative weight of what people are going through in the world. Not a huge deal, but always as a marketing company, you want the tone of what you're sending to match the tone of the user on the other end and feel like you're there with them. How do you feel about sort of like tone content creative? I am definitely always, um, I'm always going to advocate for like, yes, some tone and voice. But like I said, to for Ticketmaster with this, I think they were really trying to buy the book. So it was, it was a little didactic and just like very instructional. This is what's happening. Um, until like, again, to the more exciting pieces where you're on the wait list exclamation point 
and this is down to the ticket purchasing processes you're in like having that you know that aha like that moment having a screenshot worthy little glance you got like your beyonce um album cover you get like you got it so it progressed along the way, I think, to kind of match that tone and excitement of where you are in the process uh, to just to be on the safe side. But definitely some opportunity to play with that. But um, I think it was different, some different experience, some different technical nuances, too, because um, another city that I bought for Dallas, they had um, a partnership sounds like with Seeky. So though I like registered, did everything with Ticketmaster, it was a completely different process. I get all my communication from Ticketmaster. And then on the day of, I get my access code. I click the link and I'm like, why am I on Seeky? No one like told me this. And so like you you go through this whole process to go in and buy your ticket. I'm like on the front end, or like on the yeah, on the front end for the Ticketmaster purchasing process, you go in. I um, got in on City Verified Presale for one of one of them. So I had a City Bank card. I'd already put my information into Ticketmaster. Um, it was like gonna be ready to tap, go, purchase. Obviously not the case. See, I wasn't prepared for you. <laughs> like it was a very like disjointed experience. I'm like, I've got six minutes to go check out. I got to run downstairs. I got to grab my credit card. So just some different like technical nuances to consider. Like it's a, that still made it feel a little bit disjointed um, just depending on like your ticket buying experience. I think that's a really common co-branded problem too, yeah. where it's either a truly co-branded campaign where you might like earn something like rewards on different platforms, say like the Marriott Starbucks. Um, partnership that happens or in this case you're really having a jarring experience where you're thinking you're signing up with one brand you've built trust in that brand you're putting your faith in them to guide you through this process and then suddenly you're on a totally different page where your brain has to stop and go is this where i'm supposed to be am i doing this right and in a moment where you know you're supposed to be hustling mm-hmm. high intensity stakes a little bit of help from Ticketmaster to say you're going to leave our booking site you're going to have to re-register you're going to have to reset up an account over here. It's normal. Don't worry. Like that's something that could easily be anticipated. My experience. Um, so my process for trying to get tickets, I went through Verizon up as a Verizon customer and it was so confusing. So um, I, first of all, I didn't know that Verizon was originally doing um, the a partnership with Ticketmaster because it wasn't on the Ticketmaster site. When I went to Ticketmaster, all I saw was um, Beehive, City, and then the regular fan sale. Um, so then I randomly heard that Verizon was doing it. I Googled it. I was able to figure out all the details about it. And Verizon, um, I went to the Verizon Up page and they pretty much was um, just like, oh, you're a customer. You should be all good to go. You just sign into your Verizon account when the tickets go on sale and then we'll take you to Ticketmaster and then you'll get your tickets. That was not the case. Um, I waited, got there right. 10 minutes early, I was ready. I pressed the button as soon as it went live. Um, and then I was took to a Ticketmaster waiting room where I was told that I was um, the 2000 customer in line and that I had to wait um, um, behind a bunch of people to uh, get my tickets. And I was really sad because I thought that once I um, came into Verizon Up that it would take me right to be able to purchase the ticket. And I wasn't aware that there would be a waiting room situation. So um, I'm still currently in the process of trying to get tickets because once I got in, the seats that I wanted were not there. But luckily, it wasn't for my home city. Um, so that was for Houston. Um, so I am in the process of trying to redo the Verizon Up process and get tickets today, actually. Okay, so today is like the big day. It's the day. It's yes. not as if you're at work today. It's not as if you have <laughs> other priorities. But yeah, to your point around the waiting room, like, Again, we all operate in sort of a nine to five world. It sounds like you got hit up at six o'clock on a Sunday to buy tickets, but just this lack of ability to anticipate when you might be able to buy feels like something that could really change. What is the most optimal time for most people to be alerted to this ticket process? And if they're going to be in a waiting room, can we control how long that waiting room is a little better or give a heads up? Like it would be seemingly fairly easy to make sure this release process happened at a time that was fairly optimized to East through West Coast audiences to be able to purchase those tickets, like maybe outside the workday a little bit would be helpful or in the morning or in the, you know, in the evening. Yes, I would definitely have liked that. Like today, smack dab in the middle of my work day is yeah. not ideal. Um, I am very thankful that I had the opportunity to actually <laughs> get my tickets. So thank you, Billy, for that. <laughs> but it would have been nice not to have to, you know, sneak off and uh, try to snack tickets yeah. in the middle of the work day. 
And then also remember, like they tell you, do not use multiple devices because it will, you know, hinder your ticket buying experience. And I've seen that in my Facebook groups, like people are like, hey, I'm trying to get my tickets and it's not telling me, it's not letting me do anything. So we're like, do you, are you on your phone and a laptop? And they're like, yes. We're like, you have to get, get off one. Like you have to let it go, you know. Um, but the waiting room thing was interesting, like, because you have to be, I mean, I was there at 150, just like they told me, you know. And so, unlike you, I'm sorry, friend. Well, that was Verizon. No, I, well, no I'm just saying, friend, I only had 100 people in front of me. I would have been on time, but so Verizon told me to come to yeah. them first and not go to Ticketmaster. Yeah. I would have went to Ticketmaster. Yeah. I would have been earlier, you know, yeah. closer in line. Like, I, I blame Verizon. And then one thing, another thing that I found to be interesting was like when I was looking at seats, um, when I changed my mind and went back to a different section, the prices were going up, yes. like, and not by like a hundred dollars. You know, I'm talking about seats that I was looking at before that were four eighty one or nine ninety five. Oh and my so gosh! Like, yeah, like wow, and they crazy. shot up really quickly, and that's for me what made me go ahead and make my decision, complete my checkout process, mm -hmm. and get the hell on because I was stressed. Yes, I noticed that too. The dynamic pricing yeah. that really um, yeah. that scared me a lot. Like when I was looking at the Houston um, tickets, like there were some really good ones, and I was like, okay, I might get these. And then I went to go um, check out, and they were like, oh, that seat is gone. And then when I went back, the same seats in those sections were outrageous. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was truly crazy. It really gave people a disadvantage if you got in the gate late. Yeah, like I believe how I understand like dynamic prices to work for ticket matching, supply and demand. Obviously, if you're one of the first mm -hmm. people in the Pre-sale queue, mm -hmm. you get in there, prices look normal. Literally, our same experience as you guys. Like five minutes later, they've doubled, tripled, things like that. So mm -hmm. I did get to witness like that experience. And I'm like, I'm glad that the first day I was like, oh, this is priced me out. <laughs> and then this is priced me out. And I did not buy my friends. Like, I was like, you trying to spend fourteen hundred dollars on these six? She's like, girl, what? Yeah. I was like, you know. Yeah. Okay, that, that is kind of crazy, yeah. it, you know, it, you know, out of context with that, the heat of the moment. And then but coming back the next day, those exact same seats, half the price. Mm -hmm. So just interesting how that's all coming together with Ticketmaster, with the whole dynamic pricing, and then like trying to even put it in, you know, doing this in waves and as a process and people still kind of get bit by that. Yeah, definitely. I'm actually curious to know, how do you guys think that Ticketmaster could have leveraged data better to make this experience better for their users? Well, I mean, they definitely could have leveraged the uh, music platforms. You know, Spotify is always telling me, your artist is coming in town, go to Ticketmaster or whatever. I click the button in the pop-up, it takes me to Ticketmaster or Live Nation, you know, whichever one, which I think they're one and the same now. Yeah. Um, and I buy my tickets. Why wasn't that my Beyonce experience? Why didn't Spotify say like, hey girl, clearly you eat, breathe, and sleep Beyonce. And so her tickets are going on sale. Just buy. Here's yeah. everything that you need to know. You know, click here to sign up and then maybe direct me to the Beyonce website. And, you know, so that I can go ahead and pre-register or do whatever and then direct me to Ticketmaster. It was just extremely confusing. Yeah, so it sounds like UX just generally and sort of, like the prioritization of partnerships and brands you can buy from. Huge place to create clarity, as well as just information upfront about what to expect at every step, breaking that down, making it clean and clear for different users. You can leverage data about where people have signed up or what types of accounts they might own to help create that sense of clarity. But a more disturbing issue, I think, is this dynamic pricing. Like, if the rationale for why you would change the way people buy tickets, so you're coming out of this pure play supply and demand market where tickets cost what they cost, there's limited seats in these venues, it makes sense that, you know, ticket prices might be very high. But what we're trying to eliminate is people just gobbling up tickets and then remaking money, reselling them to desperate fans who want to go. It seems like the current Ticketmaster situation isn't solving that idea at all. It's not actually optimized towards people who want to be there in any way, shape, or form. It's just another way to control the market, control supply and demand in a way that I find to be both fear-mongering, which is just generally a terrible practice, um, but also just sort of too, too controlled and too contrived to make money for a single company. Like there's no user value. So if it was, one of the opportunities that I agree would be awesome 
is you could leverage the Spotify data or have a partnership with Spotify. Like Spotify is so good now at saying, hey, there's a concert in your area. And by the way, there's somebody who you listen to a lot. Mm -hmm. I didn't even try to buy Beyonce tickets because I'm terrified of big concert venues. <laughs> but I did try to buy tickets for Zach Bryan, who's you know similarly coming up in popularity. He's going to be playing in Charlottesville, which is a very small town where I live. And I was super frustrated that I went through the same process with AXS and didn't end up getting a chance to buy. And I was like, well, if you really want fans there, like I live in this tiny city. I went to this university where it's being hosted. I'm in the top half a percentage of listeners of this musician. Like just such a disappointing bummer. I think those are some ways that like data could really play into how you at least give like super fans a reasonable chance. I also would have liked to see like some sort of ranking in terms of how people register, you know? So ah. you, cause the way that my mind worked, they had beehive at the top. So to me, that meant these are priority fans. Mm -hmm. I am a part of the beehive. Yes. I'm going to register for this. And to know that my friend who is not a Beyonce fan and registered with city card got an access code before me. Oh, I was distraught. I was like, girl, what? Like two people I know that are not Beyonce fans got access codes. Because of their credit card affiliation. Because of their credit card affiliation. <laughs> yeah, again, like, I don't appreciate we it. all know it's all profit every day. That's the business we yeah. work in and live in. We get it. But yeah, more transparency around, hey, if you really want to optimize your chance to get this code, use City, use Verizon, come in through these brand partnerships that are paying for their customers to have a better chance. Like, why bother with a fan club if, if no one cares? Like, get that acquisition after. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I chose to go in through Verizon over going in through the Beehive because I figured I was not going to get a code. That was like my whole rationale behind it. I was like, there's so many fans. I do not think my chances of getting it a code were going to be good. Um, and I did not get one for Houston because I did register through the Beehive for that one. And for Philly, I registered um, playing on doing Verizon up. Um, but with Verizon, um, there was no like waiting for a code it was like if you had Verizon up you had access to the free sale so it seemed like a safer bet uh, That's awesome. so even yeah. though you know in the end <laughs> the process wasn't as clear if there was some clarity I probably would have had a better chance of getting tickets but since I know now today I'm getting tickets I'm really curious a little bit about the tech really that went behind all this I know like I said it could be a clunky experience for users but just knowing all of the partnerships and all what it what went into it I would love to talk and hear more about how does uh, what kind of tech stack would Ticketmaster have to have to partner with these brands for to work with a city and they have me go in and put in my credit card information and from that they know that, oh, this person should have, you know, priority access to purchase tickets and like that. What does that look like for uh, for a company? And like, what kind of tech stack do they need to enable to make that happen? Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, we've been talking about these ideas of different partnerships that could happen between, say, like a Spotify and a Ticketmaster or how they partner with Citibank or Verizon. And to be honest, that's a really complicated data strategy. You need a relatively mature tech stack to be able to just take those different components of data, organize them into profiles in a way that that data is useful. It's hard. That's like 300 level, you know, data stitching kind of stuff. Typically we would lean on something like a customer data platform to do some of that though, a really good registration process where you're asking some of these questions early, or you're going through a good UX process where you hit different screens to say, how are you planning on making this purchase? Are you going to use Verizon? Are you going to use your city card? A, that helps solve some of the problem around information transparency, but then B, it can also be another way to proxy that data. That would be where I would start before you're actually sort of like sharing data between proprietary platforms, probably more typical. But then it sounds like even in the channel messaging, uh, their Ticketmaster could be better leveraging things like in-app messages or SMS and push notifications to be sending this content of what to expect more proactively and more readily. Um, something like that would be, you know, Braze or another customer engagement type platform. And then I hope they're watching analytics. Like I hope Ticketmaster has amplitude and they're just keeping track of like where users churning, are they churning? Maybe they're not, you know, part of this is just like Ticketmaster knows they've got you. I know you're not going to churn out of this experience. And if you do, they've got another bath bill. So, but even something like Amplitude could help them organize, like, who are our true priority fans here? Who are the people who have some kind of demonstrated data point to say, 
they actually have an affinity for this musician versus just trying to like, you know, purchase tickets. So curious if y'all have other thoughts on where tech could play a role. I just wish the emails weren't so long. <laughs> they were so long. Just some best practice, like <laughs> email <laughs> drip would be good. <laughs> when I finally like went back after like, you know, my blood pressure had gone down, went back and I read the email, like you're registered. It was a whole section at the bottom that I missed. Like I didn't even, I was like, oh, how did I miss this? Like, it was just so much. I wish there had just been like maybe another email to say like, just a yeah. reminder, registration means this and just hit the key points, you know, and let yeah. me know what I have. Yeah. You know, it was just so much information. And we know that most people are checking emails on their phone. You know, I have 600 emails, unread emails since I've been here because I haven't checked my email. Um, but I have not even thought about using my laptop to check my email. It's all on my phone. Yeah, it's a good point that the higher intensity a situation is, the less information a human is capable of taking in at any given moment. So really thinking, how do we fit the necessary information on just what can fit on the home screen of that open, and then create a drip strategy to bring in more information or link to a landing page or link to an in-app content experience with more of the detail. Definitely best practice. Those are the basics. Hire us, Ticketmaster. We'd love to. This is a fun <laughs> challenge. We're being super critical because we want our concert tickets, but fun challenge to work on. It's a really hard one. It's not, it's not basic. All right. So who ended up getting tickets? I definitely got, got my tickets. All right. <laughs> I'm getting my tickets today, guys. Don't count me out. Uh, no. <laughs> We're not counting you out. We're not counting you out. As we know, I got my Beyonce tickets. You know, I just, just dream about it now. Can't wait to see her. I want her to like turn around and like sweat me, like land on my forehead. <laughs> um, what songs do you hope she plays from Renaissance, and what songs do you hope she does from Throwback? Well, <laughs> every song is a hit to start there, so never go wrong. Right now, my favorite is Virgo's Groove, so I'm definitely looking forward to doing that, having some fun dancing with that one. If I had to pick one that's not on the album, I'm gonna go way, way back. Resentment, really? Resentment. Ooh, that's a, I, it's a, it's a throwback, but it's it's so it's only good live. I watched the same okay. YouTube video from <laughs> ten years ago and sing my lungs out at home. So for me, my favorite changes every day. Um, right now, I'm back to heated being my favorite, so I'm excited because I'm seeing this. So I'm excited for Beyonce to perform that. Um, as far as throwbacks go. Honestly, me, myself, and I have been has been in rotation lately, so I would love to see her perform that. Ooh. You know, first it was Virgo's Groove. Mm -hmm. Then it was Church Girl. Mm -hmm. Then it was Heated. Then it was Pure Honey. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in the I'm that girl cozy stage. You know, I just find myself walking around being like, comfortable in my skin <laughs> just in the mirror so i think that's my favorite song now cozy um what do i want her to do honestly it doesn't matter beyonce can sing maybe see to me and i would be happy <laughs> like it, it but it, it it would have to be something off of the lemonade album because i mm -hmm. loved lemonade she was just like in her bag she was just talking like cash trash like <laughs> oh Love it. Well, thank you all for coming today to talk about something near and dear to your hearts, but then putting your sort of UX, your marketing, your life cycle lens on top of it, tech solutioning. It's such an interesting space. It's so cutting edge right now to just watch how ticket sales are evolving in real time around us. Um, so thank you for coming to talk about it. I hope you guys have a great time at Beyonce, Zayna. You're going to get your tickets today. <laughs> we are believing, we are manifesting, we are fingers crossed. Yes, and checking the time right now for you, girl. And for all of our listeners, if you have any thoughts on the state of ticket sales, how it can become a better experience, uh, what innovations you'd like to see in the market, please reach out let us know, because I'm sure we'll continue talking about this over the next few weeks and months as we see these changes in real time. And then uh, until next week, enjoy life. Enjoy uh, being out there trying to get your Beyonce on. We'll see you soon. Bye.